good, good afternoon. On behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's lecture in our series on ethical issues in healthcare reform. Uh, let me introduce our speaker today, Professor Rena Conti. Uh, Rena Conti is an assistant professor of health policy and economics in the University of Chicago's Department of Pediatrics section of hematology oncology and in the Department of Health Studies. Her research interests include identifying the drivers of medical care spending and evaluating both the intended and the unintended consequences of policy efforts to slow spending growth. Professor Conti's current projects involve estimating the economic value of new pharmacological-based treatments for depression, examining the prevalence and costs of off-label medication usage, and investigating the impact of policies intended to incentivize medical innovation. Dr. Conti was named a fellow of the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2004 and was awarded the Allen Williams Fellowship in Health Economics at the University of York in 2008. In 2008, uh, Professor Conti received a K Award, uh, as is noted uh, on this slide, uh, from the National Cancer Institute. Today, Professor Conti will be speaking on the topic shown behind me, Bending the Cost Curve in Cancer Treatment, the ACA and Beyond. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rena Conti. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, my interest is really on trying to convey to you the fundamental reforms that are ongoing in the treatment of cancer in the US currently. Um, as implemented by the ACA, but other subsequent um, legislation, and to think through both the, the rationales for, this care for these types of reforms, but also the how. How exactly are these reforms happening? What are the potential intended and unintended consequences of them? Um, and my argument <clears throat> is really that the vast majority of reform has focused on improving access to care, but also pulling providers of cancer care into measuring and identifying indicators for quality. But um, there has been less emphasis on maintaining the incentives for innovation for the treatment of cancer, but, one that, but that is a margin that should be a focus of future reform efforts for the good or for the bad moving forward. Okay, as you all know, um, healthcare spending in the United States um, is approximately 17% of GDP. Um, currently, it is larger than any other OECD country um, currently as well. Um, projected U.S. healthcare spending in less than 10 years will be approximately 20% of GDP. That is larger than what we spend on military protection, education, or any of the other functions that most, um, any other individual functions that a modern economy um, spends money on. Cancer care spending in the U.S. is approximately 5% of total spending. Um, but for commercial insurers such as Aetna, United, WellPoint, et cetera, it actually is almost one-fifth of all spending currently. Therefore, the kind of the focus both on the level of spending but also on its rate of rise um, for both the total policy community but also for commercial insurers and those who are served by commercial insurers is of particular policy in, import. In addition, the vast majority of individuals who have a cancer diagnosis or are cancer survivors are over the age of 55. Therefore, they are covered by the, the um, insurance program called Medicare, which is essentially a universal program um, that covers most medical bills for individuals. Um, there is an increased urgency 
to focus on both the level of spending and also its rise in this population because we know that the emerging aging demographics of the US will contribute to, significantly contribute to rising cancer incidence among this population and therefore rising spending among the public programs. Not only are cancer care costs high, but really they're rising fast. Um, they're rising much faster than overall healthcare spending. And as you note here, um, there's particular components of cancer care, notably drugs, that are outpacing all other, um, all other healthcare costs. Um, <clears throat> cancer care costs are rising um, at an estimated 2% growth rate. I'll show you some statistics around what we think spending on cancer drugs um, the growth rate is. But it's because of both the level, but really the rise in spending that this focus on bending the cost curve in cancer care has come to the forefront of policy discussions. Why? Um, I would argue that holding constant the demographic, the kind of booming uh, demographic changes that we are in the middle of, the big problem is the tension between the truly novel transformational care that has been delivered um, in the care of certain cancers, most notably by the application of new technologies, and its uneven and unequal distribution in the general population. Or in other words, <laughs> there's the good, the bad, and the ugly that we must contend with in terms of solving this policy conundrum and we'll probably be dealing with for the next 20 years. The good. Um, we are clearly winning the war on some, sorts, some cancers. Um, this has clearly been a significant center of innovation and investment by our own cancer center, but many other of the noted cancer centers and noted major medical centers across the country. Unlike many other statistics and many other areas of um, healthcare where you will see statistics such as higher spending does not increase life expectancy, in cancer, we actually have some good evidence that yes, we spend more money, but actually we get more significant survival. Um, overall, across, um, set, across 10 cancer um, sites, but also relative to our peers um, in other OECD countries. Um, oh, I should, argue, I should mention that some of this difference um, is likely due to the, um, um, the way in which treatments are applied, but also likely has to do with the way in which um, we screen. Um, and there are differences between the way we screen for cancer in the US and other, e other EU countries. Probably one of the most notable success stories in cancer is related to pediatric oncology, where there has been a significant rise in survival. Um, for, many of the, um, for many of the most prevalent cancers, including Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The application of new therapies, notably new drugs, has clearly made an important impact on um, survival in the adult setting. In fact, I would argue that the vast, the, much of the increase in survival that we see in that um, paper comparing, or in those statistics comparing our um, survival rates to Europe have to do with the applicate with the treatment of CML and other blood cancers. However, the application of screening, but also the application of treatment, um, um, can be characterized as having overuse, misuse, and underuse coexisting throughout our healthcare system. I'm going to show you some, t some statistics related to chemo um, in its um, application in the US, but this equally applies to screening protocols, diagnostic tests, and um, surgical procedures as well. And then um, the other component of spending is, is price. And we, I think, all know that there's astronomical prices being charged for many of these new novel therapies. Some would say they're even pornographic. 
Um, okay, so just to give you a close up on the expenditures, the spending on cancer therapies, for just a handful of these drugs that are listed here, we spent approximately $10 billion two years ago on them. Um, Anti-cancer drugs rank first in terms of spending across all therapeutic categories. Um, in the past, in, according to the last report by IMS Health, a data vendor that, fo that focuses on the pharmaceutical industry. Um, there's been a doubling in spending on these drugs alone in the past six years. What about their application in clinical practice? Um, in a paper that myself and colleagues published last year, we examined the um, on-label and off-label use of several novel chemotherapies that um, are currently branded um, in the US market. And what we found um, was that on these 10 drugs alone, we spent $23 billion in 2012. And um, the off-label use of these chemotherapeutics ranged in a pro as, as approximately 20 to 30 percent of all usage, all applications. Not all off-label use is non-indicated or non-clinically supported use. What we found was approximately half of the use was supported by some guidelines, notably the NCCN guidelines that are um, really the basis for reimbursement for Medicare but also for commercial insurers, but the rest was not indicated and non-supported by evidence. And when there was evidence, it was actually, the evidence was of poor quality, um, has also been noted by my colleague Tina Shi. It's not only in drugs. Um, Palliative care, I'd argue, is one of the um, areas of cancer where it is clear that its application is underused in the population. Um, we all know that palliative care's application in, um, in lung cancer, but also in several other cancers, has been shown to prolong survival, but also improve the quality of life and decrease anxiety and depression among, in, among patients, but also their families. In addition, in every single trial that has examined the application of hospice care um, into um, the community, it has shown to be cost savings, both for patients and their families facing very large medical bills at the end of their life, but also for the insurers that insure them. And yet, we know that the application, that the use of hospice and also the, um, the um, discussion of advanced directives um, in the cancer population appears to be woefully um, under, underutilized relative to targets um, that have been established by, um, by guideline committees. And then there are the prices. This is um, data taken from my colleague Peter Bach at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, where he um, estimated median and mean monthly prices for an average indicated patient using, all, using um, these, all of these drugs for on-label FDA-approved indications. We've extended his analysis um, through 2008 all the way through 2013. And what you see is that median cancer and monthly median cancer costs are rising over time. Maybe this is okay because we're getting um, more value for the money. Maybe you would argue that, um, well, we pay more, but we get more. We are surviving better. Okay, maybe. Um, when we quality adjust for survival alone, um, these drug prices, what we find is that prices appear to still be rising even when you take out that quality of care, life is improving part. And they're rising on average five, per, per five percentage points a year. Higher than inflation, which is generally around two to three percent a year during this time period, and also higher than any other consumer good that we know of um, in terms of price um, available in the U.S. Maybe art is an, is an example <laughs> that um, contradicts that, but nothing else that is a normal good. 
if that's not the ugly news enough, um, there is very significant racial and economic disparities in the use of screening, access to treatment, the application of treatment, and fundamentally survival and other types of outcomes that have been noted in, um, in all types of cancer, uh, of cancer patients. Um, I will, um, there's a lot of literature on this, but I'm gonna summarize using the follow, following. Just look at the difference between whites and blacks in the death rates for all cause um, cancer mortality among male patients and female patients. And I will summarize from the IOM report. Individuals with private insurance are more likely to receive recommended appropriate cancer screening and treatment than are individuals who have public insurance, Medicare or Medicaid, and who are racially and uh, racial or ethnic minorities or who are poor. This is unconscionable. I think these statistics, um, both this high and in increased spending, the pornographic prices, the misapplication and underapplication of, of known um, quality and cost effective treatments, has engendered a very broad and deep questioning of value of our cancer system in the US. Um, and um, we see it propping up now in the popular press. This is an article that was published in October of 2013 from the New Yorker, which is a widely read newspaper kind of periodical in the metro area, um, um, extolling the fact that these drug, drugs clearly can extend life but in particular, the second generation of these drugs have v maintained very high prices and that the insurers who pay for them, the providers who purchase them and or recommend them in their patient population, and most notably patients, are bending and buckling under the pressure of these very high prices. This, these type of articles also make me very popular at my parents' dinner parties. <laughs> okay. Um, the IOM has um, had a series of mediated discussions and debates and articles that have come out of defining value in cancer care since at least 2008, maybe earlier. Um, I'm going to note the most recent one that was um, released a couple of months ago and that my colleague Tina Shi was a member of the, of the committee um, that focused on options for reform and why must we focus on reform and also in what areas should we focus on reform. And I'll quote, cancer care delivery system in the US is in crisis. It's often not as patient-centered, accessible, coordinated, or evidence-based as it could be. Before we get into the reform specifics, I want you to understand um, and appreciate the political economy of reform. And what I mean by that is that the system has evolved for a reason to be what it is today. There are many natural constituencies that are very focused on maintaining the spending that we have and the application of new therapies um, and new diagnostics to remain increasing contributing to increased costs. I want you first to appreciate the natural constituencies in the use and the application of these new technologies, and then we'll talk about the prices. First, there are patients. Although on average, patient cancer survival has increased and there have been some notable um, gains in certain cancers, many, many patients that you all see every day face very significant poor prognosis, very significant, and are clearly facing imminent death. Providers have to talk to these patients and face death and the reality of not doing much for them um, every day and also face significant practice revenue on the order of still 50 to 70% of revenue for outpatient care related to the application of, of physician-injected in or infused chemotherapies. So there's this natural kind of, um, um, there's this natural kind of impetus to use these therapies if and when they can potentially be helpful. 
There's also, as you all know, increased pressure by providers in the outpatient setting to just simply maintain use and actually expand use because you get paid and or you get um, um, quality bonuses and other types of incentives for increasing use, increasing RVUs, driving revenue into the institution or into the practice. Um, and because of this, we believe that this market is fundamentally rife with physician-induced demand um, for these therapies, but also that patients are also pushing providers to provide care that may not be indicated at the margin. What about price? Drug companies are clearly monopolists um, in the branded space. They have every, they have a temporary patent right to charge monopoly prices until that patent expires um, 12 to 20 years after they launch the drug. However, monopolists um, can't charge any price for the drug. They must be responsive to a price that relates to underlying um, demand for their product. And there is a series of um, inf infrastructure in our system that essentially makes them be able to charge very high prices right now. The first is that patients are very well insured at the margin. What that means is that they don't, they may, you may know of patients who face very significant financial hardship related to the care of their cancer. However, on average, most patients are not paying $120,000 for the care of their cancer in a given year. Instead, they're paying on average somewhere around $500 or less for the treatment of, um, for the treatment of conditions that require chemo. In addition, Manufacturers have um, extended very generous copayment assistance programs to patients that are in need. And I would argue that this is one way in which they are able to um, maintain very high prices. In this system, it's not patients that can adjudicate value or even push back because they don't know what the price of their therapy is going to be or the cost of their therapy. And even if they do, they don't really pay that much of it. So therefore, value assessment, whether this therapy or not is worth the price, is actually left to doctors and hospitals. And the truth is that, that um, most physicians don't know what the price is, the cost implications of treating um, a given a patient with a given cancer, but also there's no comparative effectiveness and there's no cost and coverage um, for determining um, both coverage decisions, um, formulary placement, or any other way of kind of adjudicating value in this um, system on a systematic way. And in Medicare, there are explicit prohib prohibitions that regarding tiered formulary placement for drugs in um, covered under the medical under the pharmacy benefit under Part D. And commercial insurers are actually very, very loath to go against whatever Medicare has decided to cover because um, in, the, in, the, in the small number of cases in which they have tried to push back or tried to ration care um, in the cancer space, they have faced very significant public pressure to reverse those decisions. Here are, uh, here are IOM's most recent recommendations for reform. They are mostly focused on um, improving quality of care, um, with the idea being that we can at least try to um, reduce the level of spending, if not hopefully the, um, the rate of spending. You should notice here that um, um, there's very li limited discussion of the cancer research infrastructure, which I'll come back to in a second. The majority of current reform is focused on, three, uh, on these three areas. I'll um, go into more depth in them now. As you all know, ACA reforms will have a very significant improvement in access to care. Many, but not all, of the estimated 11 million newly insured individuals will be young and healthy. But for those with cancer, there are several provisions that will clearly have significant benefit. 
The first being the lifting of the pre-existing clauses for commercial insurance enrollment that, were, that was lifted already in 2010. But also, um, the IOM report suggests that, individual, that individuals in the commercial market suffering from cancer or who are survivors of cancer will benefit. And they'll benefit not just from increased access, but also for reduced copayment amounts at the point of service for both the screening for their cancers, the treatment of their cancers, and also the kind of maintenance therapy and maintenance monitoring of their cancers moving forward. In addition, all compliant um, insurer plans um, with the ACA provisions must include certain defined benefits, which include access to preventive cancer care screening for breast, for colorectal, and for some others at low or no cost. These are clear improvements, and these are also clear improvements in, directed at reducing the socioeconomic disparity in at least access to screening and also access to some sorts of treatment. In addition, there has been this really wonderful movement by providers and many commercial insurers to promote what is considered to be valuable care and to um, unemphasized care that is clearly um, valuable at the clearly unvaluable at the margin, which includes promoting adherence to evidence. As you all know, most of the commercial insurers, WellPoint, um, United, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, are all rolling out um, pathway programs that for indicated cancer or for indicated treatments for for cancer. Um, those will probably be live somewhere um, in the next six to uh, months to a year. Um, this is in addition to the kind of closed panel programs um, um, promoted by U.S. Oncology, where there's very significant and constrained pathways um, for the care of many cancers in that network that are now going to be linked um, directly to provider payment um, in the next um, in the next six months. There's also um, these efforts to identify low value screening and treatment, which include the Choosing Wisely campaign by ASCO and other providers. I just want to mention to you that palliative care appears to be one of the important um, uh, planks of ASCO's um, Choosing Wisely campaign moving forward. There are other reforms that are targeted to reduce wasted spending and improve quality of care more generally. I'm going to focus on the ones that, that, um, that target pharma um, drugs spending and also physician care um, for the following reason, which is um, in a recent paper it was identified that, um, that physician and clinical services and also um, spending on prescription drugs will be the locus of where ACA reforms will likely push out spending trends in the next um, several years. So actually understanding what, what happens with these services in the outpatient setting where the majority of cancer care is delivered is really important to understanding reform. So first there's sequestration. Um, sequestration has a very significant impact on um, outpatient cancer care treatment. Um, reimbursement by Medicare for the use of all physician administered drugs, which is approximately 78 to 80 percent of spending on all cancer drugs currently, has been reduced by approximately 28 percent um, since 2011. Um, this is a very significant pay cut on the fact uh, if you recognize that the majority of patient of outpatient service revenue is coming from these drugs. Um, and you can see in a recent report that ASCO suggests that um, in 80% of their practices, these cuts are affecting the, uh, the financial viability of their practices, but also other, um, other care that they're providing um, to patients. I should tell you that ab approximately a month ago, there was um, a budget deal. And the budget deal, um, um, by Congress did not lift this pay cut to doctors. They had the opportunity. They were he lobbied very heavily 
by oncologists, by other types of medical specialists, rheumatologists, et cetera, neurologists, that um, clearly um, have a lot of practice revenue coming from, these from the use of these drugs. It was not extent, it was not lifted, and therefore I think in many oncology communities we view this as the new normal. This is the revenue that's going to come from the, from the application of these drugs. What about quality of care measurement? Um, under ACA provisions, there was um, a um, non-mandatory um, rollout of certain types of physician quality reported initiatives for physicians and physician group practices in the outpatient setting, which um, um, in the Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012 makes these reporting requirements <coughs> mandatory for all care in the outpatient setting, oncology and other um, provision. Um, it requires reporting for at least 50% of patients and includes both process outcomes, satisfaction type outcomes, but also real outcomes related to the care of, um, of patients. Um, the mandatory reporting requirements for these quality standards has a carrot and a stick attached to it starting, in, starting now. Um, there is an, there's a small bonus, excuse me, there's a small bonus for the satisfactory reporting of these um, measures for physician reimbursement by Medicare. And there's a significant stick, which is asymmetric notice. There's an avoidance of a 1.5 to 2% reduction in your reimbursement associated with non-participation related to this performance. And it requires, in order to not get the decrement, you must report both on these process outcomes and at least one patient level outcome um, for 50% of your patients. Um, in 2015, this public reporting goes live. So this is at the individual provider level. It's all doctors who practice in the outpatient setting, and these, will be, these uh, measures will be reported publicly. Um, and you will, be able, you will be identified by name and location. There are 110 measures currently in the PQRS as, as, exist, as exists now. Six of them, if I can count correctly, are related to cancer care. Um, the majority of them, as you can see, are focus on breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and a handful of, of um, liquid tumors. Um, I think that um, these measures reflect, honestly, the state of what we know about how to measure quality of care um, in, this in the cancer population, but it's clear that more are to follow for other cancers in the metastatic and non-metastatic setting. Um, I would argue that quality measurement in outpatient oncology practice is actually at its infancy. We know a little bit about what are markers for cancer care for some metastatic conditions, but um, not for, certainly not for all. Um, and in particular, we know something about breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and non-small cell lung cancer, um, and le some leukemia care, but not much for the rest of those cancers. Um, and we know what predicts some outcomes, particularly in the inpatient setting, but not necessarily in the outpatient setting. This will be a focus of major investments by research, both by our cancer outcomes group, but also by others around the country moving forward, no doubt. The 50% reporting requirement is clearly a burden um, for our institution and um, for other outpatient providers of cancer care particularly for providers who um, are facing outcome measurement in a population that faces other types of disadvantage. Um, this can be particularly a burden and um, it's non-trivial to implement this. And then finally, there's the individual level provider um, level and it's public reporting. Um, there is some exemptions. You can report these measures at the group practice level. But I have been very concerned um, that at the, provi the provider level um, doesn't actually capture the way in which modern cancer care is provided. 
And that's because, as you all know, there's been very significant um, merger and acquisition and affiliation activity since 2004, 2005 among outpatient oncology groups with themselves and also with, can with um, cancer centers and other hospitals. And because of that, the individual physician actually ha may have very limited control over what happens th to a given patient because they're following the kind of dictates or the des decisions around pathways that are being um, that are being um, accepted and promulgated throughout the clinical practice across multiple providers, across multiple institutions, none of which are captured under the current PQRS system. There's also, um, it's very clear that the PQRS will be used um, to tie individual payment for individual types of outcomes in the future, but there is no, currently, way of either quality um, assessment or reimbursement risk adjustment for dealing with the fact that some institutions or some providers take care of very much more complex patients than others. Um, and um, myself and Dick Larson were just in Germany where I learned that this is, that the lack of risk adjustment um, is also true in Germany and Switzerland and some other countries, but um, but they also don't publicly report outcomes and, and provide that information to patients to, um, to make uh, care judgments on. Okay. Um, what about payments tied to quality? Um, I would argue that the old regime of um, oncologists in the outpatient setting getting revenue reimbursement or significant revenue from chemo administration is likely um, going away, or at least their days are numbered and it's going to be a food fight in Congress and in other places um, how that gets done. It is also very clear that, um, um, that in order to make oncologists whole, when those reimbursements go away, you need to bundle care and re reform um, reimbursement in the outpatient setting more fundamentally to reflect the actual care that's provided both in the initial stages of treatment but also its maintenance and monitoring over time. Their, ASCO just proposed their payment reform for the outpatient setting. There are other groups that are also um, announcing other proposed reforms, notably United, um, who has gone public saying that they're bundling um, the uh, payment in the outpatient setting for certain types of cancers and have had very significant success in reducing costs and improving quality. We'll see on the evidence on that moving forward. We also know that, you, that U.S. oncology is already tying payments um, to quality of care. In the ASCO setting, but also in many other of these proposed um, reform efforts, there's very clear additional payment adjustments for quality, for pathway adherence, and also for clinical trial participation. Um, no, I would, as a consumer of reform efforts and of proposals moving forward, I am very um, cognizant and aware of exactly what will be included and not included in the bundle. Um, what doctors will get, will get paid for and what they won't be getting paid for moving forward. In all of these reforms that I've mentioned, not one of them has mentioned really continued investment in innovation and all of the stuff that has fundamentally transformed the care of cancer, at least on average. Again, I'll note the IOM's recommendation that does not mention continued investment. Uh, this is reflective of a larger political reality, which is that NIH funding is essentially stagnant. I think we'll end up with $3.2 billion in NIH appropriations this year. NCI um, is also, budget is also stagnant. Again, I think the final budget deal will ha be something around $5.2 billion for the next year. Um, this stagnation um, in level is a clear budget cut. Um, from pre-sequester levels of 2011. And also, let's just be honest, fundamentally alters investments. It alters investments in our institution. 
It alters investments in the, cl in the clinical trials um, cooperative groups that we have both in the US but also in the international setting. And it alters um, the discussion that we're having, which is mostly around the focus on quantifying the true economic benefit of continued public investment in basic science and in um, more applied science that, the, that we pay for. But also, um, there has been this interest in the potential application of economics to assessing value for phase three trials and maybe even for phase two trials moving forward to really trade off where exactly should we be spending our money given that our money appears to be very limited and maybe dwindling over time. Then there's the price discussion. Um, it is clear that pressure is building in the US policy circles for the federal government to take action on the price of, on the launch price of new drugs. Cancer drugs are the poster child for what's wrong. And therefore, you will see discussions like the Time article, like the New Yorker article, uh, like there's a recent article in the New York Times um, around the prices of drugs and how they're onerous to patients and how, how to balance that onerousness with um, remaining incentives for innovation. Most of these discussions have focused on insurer payments. So exactly what Medicare will pay or exactly what insurers, well, other commercial insurers have paid. There's been a lot of discussion in the popular press about what patients actually pay. But I anticipate that as um, we move into um, the second phase of reform and up through the election, we're going to hear more about this um, from patients' perspective. Um, also, it's very clear that um, it, these type of discussions may not alter the uh, next wave of cancer drugs that um, are entering. I think there are 900 cancer drugs that are currently in development, um, but many, many of them are about to kind of hit our shores, a smaller percentage of the nine, a smaller amount than the 900. But what it really does is have a negative effect on continued investment these in the earlier phases of development, um, in really kind of where companies are really thinking strategically about where they're putting their money in phase one settings and in, in killing projects or remaining projects that may have clear economic benefit moving forward, where they can actually make the value case. Um, also, I just want to note that manufacturers um, are very reluctant to give list price concessions on branded drugs, um, in part because they have a, there's a lot of discounts, rebates, and patient assistance programs that are very generous already in the system. So, and also the U.S. market for prices actually determines all price negotiations for all OECD countries moving forward. So you change the prices here, it has widespread, it wreaks widespread havoc for their negotiations moving forward for us and everybody else. Um, so what you see here is this kind of tension between wanting the things that are just maybe just about to transform care, um, at least on the margin for some patients, but also how do we balance incentives for innovation um, in, the, in the branded space? I don't know. Stay tuned for what uh, the discussion is. One place where I think um, we could, ha we already have the tools really to um, start to reduce prices and maybe spending on these drugs is the promotion of um, cancer therapies that are generic or will about to go or are about to go generic um, in the U.S. market. Um, the poster child for this is Imatinib, Imatinib Gleevec. It's about to go off patent in 2015. There are six or even eight manufacturers in the market that are saying that they're going to enter the U.S. market. Um, and there is some discussion out there by commercial insurers that they may actually break with Medicare formulary restrictions in this market for the commercially insured population and employ generic substitution and or tiered formularies for their commercially insured non-Medicare 
patients for certain selected cancer, for certain selected patient populations um, who would be eligible for a matinib as being first line therapy for their cancer. We will see how that plays out. It's going to be very interesting. Um, one of the reasons that generic entry is really interesting and important here is that um, there's evidence that the price reduction is very significant. Over, um, we estimate that for in physician injected drugs, it's the price discount is somewhere between 70 and 90 percent off of reimbursement in the branded setting um, after two years of being available generic. Um, and there's been enough competition in the market. Um, this trend holds true for oral drugs too. In fact, it may be even exasperated in the oral drug market. And it also appears to reflect what we saw in the SSRI market for the antidepressants in the past, in the past decade, where remember we had all those discussions around the potential misuse of antidepressants and all the spending that we were, that we were applying to them. That has largely gone away because there's been so much generic entry into that market and the take up rate in the general population for those generics has also been very significant. The only other thing I want to note here is that although Europe has a um, pathway for biosimilars, for biologically based drugs, we have legislation, but we don't have a final rule on entry. And therefore, even if we promote the generic use of um, drugs in certain cancer markets, we can't do so right now for, with others, particularly some of the most um, novel drugs um, in the market, um, and again, we'll see how that um, plays out as these price concession discussions move forward. Okay, so um, that's the end of my talk. I want to summarize by saying that, um, again, any reform effort has to balance um, these significant and widespread um, problems with the application of new novel therapies um, for certain patients and um, for certain conditions with the investments that we are, with the gains that we already have from the investments that we've already made in 30 years of the war on cancer. Um, that current reform efforts really focus on improving access and defining quality of care measurement. This fundamentally is going to address many of the challenges that we face moving forward, but this is also a huge change for oncology and requires a lot of really smart people in a room thinking about how to address some of these um, changes um, that are going to be um, fair to both physicians and to patients as public reporting gets um, underway. And then the question is, where is investment in research um, as a priority um, in all of this? Um, will price con control discussions on the branded drug market um, be paired with um, um, greater incentives for the use of generics, but also promotion or entry into the use of generics moving forward in this market? Um, Lastly, I would like to note um, that we have at the University of Chicago a cancer economics group. Um, it is led by Tina Shi. There are many of us um, that are also participate. As we all undergo these changes together, there will be many questions regarding how to improve quality of care and also how to improve the efficiency of cancer care in the inpatient and the outpatient setting. And we have the existing tools um, and the existing infrastructure through this mechanism to really use research um, to, uh, to answer those questions. So I hope you will use us as a resource. Thank you. Thanks, Rena, for the great talk. So we're going to open up for questions and answers right now. And while people are thinking of questions, I'll, I'll take advantage of the first one here that uh, you mentioned on one of your slides uh, the word value being a key word now. And I'm wondering, as a health economist, how, what kind of value measures would you use under two circumstances? One where you can't include costs because Congress doesn't want us to include costs in a lot of different times. And the second, under conditions where you could include costs, what kind of value measures would you use? It's a great question. Um, so I think that 
comparative effectiveness of the existing technologies across all its modalities. So drugs and surgery and radiation um, is again, in cancer is again at its infancy. And really we, we, haven't, we don't have the information to arm doctors to adjudicate value across all of these different modalities or across even within modality or even within therapeutic class at this stage for certain types of conditions. Um, to make that concrete, we have five different TKIs now on the market. They are all priced somewhere between ninety dollars and $120,000 per year. Um, there is no, as far as I can tell, straight head-to-head -head comparative effectiveness data that can fully inform doctors as to how to treat um, CML with all of these different treatment modalities and which is actually going to provide the most cost effective or even quality effective care in a, in a reasonable time frame. Under costs, <laughs> um, I, um, 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 we have an infrastructure already in place that assesses um, the value of pharmaceutical interventions relative to their costs. They're called pharmacy benefit managers and in plus insurance providers. Um, I am convinced that although we do not use that technology now or those tools now in the cancer space, um, there is no reason that pharmacy benefit managers in um, consultation with NCCN or other types of provider groups could not go through and start to adjudicate value relative to costs, but also negotiate very significant price concessions for some of these drugs. Particularly when there's a generic already in, available in the therapeutic space or where there are multiple treatment options. To be honest, European countries are already doing some of this. Um, and there's no reason why we couldn't do it other than the fact that our, our plans aren't structured that way now. Um, the pharmacy benefit, which has those formulary replace, has those formulary adjudications, isn't, um, doesn't really apply to cancer drugs, and there is no body, if you will, that sits over and adjudicates value and or costs and or negotiates value and cost with insurer, with, sorry, with, um, with manufacturers for the physician administered drug market unless you're in a U.S. oncology market or you sit in a group that has very significant power to um, price negotiate already. Question. From an economic standpoint, we're starting to see the carrot and stick approach coming in, you know, certainly through uh, the Taxpayer Relief Act and now through SGR legislation, uh, where they're looking at sort of 10% bonuses or, or cuts. Do we know what level those should be to change behavior? Because obviously from an institution standpoint, there's a cost of doing business, right? For us to invest to change quality is going to require from investment. So at, at what point? Are the carrots and sticks enough? And what does the economic literature say that you actually change our behavior versus us just saying, you know, a 2% cut, it's not worth it for me to invest in, you know, a set of nurses to make sure they're calling patients so they don't end up in the ER? Do we so, know? I, I mean, I think it is the question. Um, honestly, and I'm looking at my colleague Tamara Konetska, who's really the expert in, um, in public reporting of outcomes and also um, provider. Um, comparisons in these outcomes. Um, um, what I think we know is that um, we should measure provider performance on things that they can actually control and not on things that they can't actually control. And um, that the incentives shouldn't be for cost cutting or efficiency, shouldn't be so strict um, that we actually worry about stenting on care or actually the adverse selection or the, um, the shunning of certain types of patients. Um, one of the things that I, that I bring, one of the reasons that I bring up the lack of risk adjustment for in, in this space is that um, we have no mechanism right now for um, adjusting quality outcomes based on the severity of the patient. 
Um, and we all know that we face patients with very significant comorbidities that don't look like clinical trials, um, or those enrolled in clinical trials, and therefore are not going to have outcomes that look that are consonant with the clinical trials data. And um, so how do we actually com make comparisons that are actually apples to apples at the provider level um, um, given this comorbidity or this complexity? I I don't know, but it's a really, it's a really, it really is worrisome to me because you can have a lot of bad behavior at the margin um, with the um, um, with the ways in which these measured are, measures are conceptualized now. Is there anything else I should add tomorrow on that? A lot of the data you presented obviously was important looking at kind of clinical pathways. Have you looked at? next-gen sequencing as a way to reduce some of those costs and looking at the Portable Care Act at all? I'm embarrassed to tell you that I don't know what that, those words mean. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Can you explain? Yeah, so basically you're looking at the entire genome and how the drug reacts for clinical pathways. So it's looking at a more targeted approach to looking at pharmacokinetics. Yeah. And what it does is instead of looking at experimental in drugs, you can target that specific disease state like uh, myeloma, things like that, and have a drug to create the effect you need to get for uh, investigating. <coughs> um, yeah, thank you. I've thought about this a little bit. Um, my view is that that technology will be a very significant um, gain to manufacturers and other people who are invested in development of new technologies. Um, but note that when you can predict how a drug will actually function in a patient, you should be able to charge more for it. And so I think that the, the promise of personalized medicine is that we'll have matched therapies for individuals and patients, but also we are seeing already in some examples where the prices are, be, high, very high prices are being um, justified based on that personalized approach. Um, the, other, other, the only other thing I will mention here is that in theory it would be great to be able to know a lot of this genomic information in order to tailor therapies or even tailor, tailor screening programs, but that would require an insurance system that actually is invested in patients in the long term. And maybe we're getting there. Um, um, you know, some closed door insurance plans already are getting there. Kaiser, for example, um, has been there for a long time. Um, but I think we're going to live through iterations of insurance um, that may not be um, so invested in the long term performance or optimization of therapy, even if it's in the patient's interest or in society's interest. Great job, Rena. Uh, I was curious. Um, about the trade-off between having uh, patients sort of face more of the costs of some of these high-cost cancer drugs, um, which might lead to less overutilization in some cases, might lead to lower prices for some of those drugs, versus something which I think is a big policy concern right now, which is adherence to therapies and the ability of these uh, pharmaceutical companies to provide patient assistance programs and as well possibly some public assistance programs to reduce the cost of care. Do you have any sense, is there a way to thread the needle and get sort of the perfect trade-off there between those, some of those two competing goals of reducing costs or uh, increasing the cost of care and, and implication for quality and cost? Um, thank you for the question, Fabrice, who's also a health economist who also studies cancer care. <laughs> um, I, um, so basically, there's a tension between rationing on the demand side by making patients pay more um, for certain types of care and rationing on the supply side through physicians' um, choice, insurer choice, coverage, and reimbursement decision making. Um, I um, am, there's a, re well, I am, was, um, I am very concerned that patients are already facing very high costs um, for, the, for, the, for their cancer care therapy. And there's some recent evidence at, that adherence rates, even for the treatment of, um, of CML, where, um, again, imatinib has really transformed this disease to be a chronic condition. You can live 20 years with this disease now. Um, it is very low with the existing 
incentives in place. Um, so I, I guess I really worry that we want patients to know something about the cost of their care, but we also may not want um, the care to be so prohibitively expensive to them um, or for them to really be the ones who have to adjudicate value here. They really don't have the tools to do it. Um, I would argue that doctors and hospitals, um, other types of professionals, um, and honestly, again, um, the apparatus that already exists um, in PBMs and GPOs know much more about how to adjudicate value and how to price negotiate than patients do. Oh, I, I should also argue that in Europe, um, there is no copayment for cancer care. There's no copayment for cancer care. Patients on the margin are, are completely insured. They are at the mercy of their doctor, their healthcare system to make the choices for them, and there's no sense that they have a role to play in adjudicating value. They get what doctors and the health system thinks is, think is the most appropriate care. Um, I just wanted to ask for clarification on three specific statistics um, that you used in your presentation. The first one is that you said there were 1.6 million cancer diagnoses, and the question is whether that's an incidence number or a prevalence number. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, you said 1.6 million cancer diagnoses. Is that an incidence number per year, or yeah. is that a prevalence number of the total yeah, number I think, of people in the country with cancer? I think it's an incidence number. And it's actually not my statistic. I took it from the IOM <laughs> report. The second one is um, you show the difference in survival between European countries and the United States in cancer diagnosis. And the question is, do you know how much of that is due to perhaps an early diagnosis bias in the United States? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I published that paper with my colleague, Tomas Philipson, who's at the Harris School. And we had a lot of arguments about how to actually interpret that difference. Um, and I will not fall on my sword in front of you to say that even though we did some falsification tests to make sure that we're, try we're trying to compare incident diagnosed cases by stage and by line across the US and the other um, OECD countries that were um, in our report, it's clear that the detection rates are very different. Um, it's also clear that just the availability of screening is very different across these different countries, and it's very hard to statistically adjust for all of that um, in our analysis. So in the end, are you convinced that it is real or not? Um, I'm convinced that it's probably not real for CML and the treatment of p some pediatric cancers, but maybe realer for, for metastatic um, non-small cell lung cancer and a handful of other cancers. Okay, and the, the last statistic that I wanted to ask you about, um, actually there's two more. Um, one is that um, <laughs> you said that with the PQRS requirement, it's <clears throat> with respect to half of patients. Is that with respect to half of patients patient visits or with respect to half the people that you actually see during the course of the year, many, some of whom you see many times? Yeah, it's half of patient visits and there's actually some eligibility requirements regarding the patients. Um, this is a requirement that's not only about cancer care, it's, re it's a requirement for all outpatient care. So I, can, I provided the reference for you to look up the specifics. And I guess the last one is the cancer spending um, you divide it into 24% for drugs and 22% for physicians and 54% for hospitals. And that doesn't leave anything um, for nursing homes or um, equipment or anything else. Um, right, so that's not my statistic. That's United, that's the head of, US, of United Oncology's statistic. Um, and that's his reporting. I'm assuming that um, hospice care and nursing home care is in the hospitalization rate, and I don't know about the rest because it's, again, it's not my statistic. Uh, there's just a policy questions and biopaper questions in c controlling the cost of cancer care, but there's also public attitudes and culture, and it seems to me most of us 
especially those of us who are not physicians and not knowledgeable, we equate excellent care with really intensive and expensive care and that there's a cultural dimension to, uh, to cancer care that has to somehow be addressed. And I just wonder if you could comment on how we might have a different kind of public conversation about how we should take care of our loved ones with cancer that's a more humane and disciplined approach than, than the families are often pushing for uh, when, when they're in places like, uh, like UCMC with, uh, with a cancer diagnosis. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, honestly, I think our culture is the heart of the issue here um, in many ways, that in its, it's, our, its patient's cultural orientation to intensive care um, and really a lack of understanding or appreciation for the importance and value of palliative care at the end of life, which I think um, my colleague Tom Smith has done a very beautiful job of articulating um, in a variety of different cancers and um, in a variety of different control trials where he shows benefit and also um, cost savings. Um, there's also our own institutional cultural biases, which are to treat intensively and to do the new thing and to think that we should always be on the cutting edge all the time. Um, you know, we have an experimentalist mindset um, and that has provided great advance, but it also, um, it, I think many of these changes signal for good or for bad, um, kind of a less value placed on experimentation, on innovation, at the expense of public payers. For your sustainable efforts. Um, I guess a little more of a kind of a raw economics question. I mean, you, you mentioned that in the recent budget deal, the 28% a reduction um, has uh, not been removed, and if, and if you assume that that Continues. For, for provider payments or yes. for NIH? Okay. For provider payments. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you, uh, I guess the first question is, have you contemplated uh, that if that um, is maintained and is extended into the market, are you expecting any type of potential reduction in some of these launch prices over time? Or if you haven't contemplated it, um, are yeah. you planning? To yeah, thank you. Um, this is actually what I spend a lot of my time thinking about right now. Um, let me unpack the 28% um, pr price reduction um, in two ways. Um, the first is that's a reimbursement price. That's the level that Medicare pays for um, the application of a drug. That is not the acquisition price that a doctor or a hospital pays for those drugs, okay? And so Basically, what we're seeing is that revenue is declining from reimbursement, but um, if I was a provider facing that level of reimbursement change, that would potentially induce some unanticipated behavior on my part, um, which is to go out and look for much lower acquisition cost discounts for these drugs in the market to maintain my revenue. We are seeing that in the market. We've been seeing that since 2006 at least and probably really ramped up in 2007, 2008 um, with consolidation between certain types of outp outpatient practices and certain types of hospitals that get very deep discounts on these drugs um, on the order of 70 to 90%. And so now, I think more than 50% of oncology practices have some sort of merger and affiliation with one of these types of institutions. Um, so think of it as providers have responded and they're moving and they are altering their, the way in which they actually get these discounts. Will that actually have the desired effect on prices? No. Um, and that's because Manufacturers knowing that they have to increase the amount of money um, in the discounted price have every incentive to raise their list price <laughs> and therefore be made whole one way or another. So it is, it's perverse um, and <laughs> it's the wild world of, you know, of uh, US pricing policy. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for being here. One of the IOM recommendations that was listed on your slide was team-based care. Can you comment on any innovations in that area that are um, that you see as particularly relevant right now? Um, so, so honestly, um, that dimension of quality improvement is not really what I have focused my research on. Um, I can tell you that there is some innovation at our institution related to team-based care in the inpatient cent center. David Meltzer has a, has a CMMI grant where he's looking at um, continuous um, care at the locus of one provider, one set of providers, which includes patients with cancer, but again, treated in the inpatient setting. I don't know how it's being applied in the outpatient setting. It's an important question, though. You got the world's expert here, last chance. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about price control for pharmaceuticals, at least the uh, initial price. What deal did the pharmaceutical companies cut uh, on the ACA arrangement that might encourage or prevent uh, such price controls? Um, I think that, okay, so um, I think manufacturers know that they're already on the hook for um, funding some part of the closure of the donut hole in Medicare. And this is for every, this is not about cancer, this is about for everything. And so manufacturers already are anticipating that they will be the large underwriters, if not the sole underwriters, of the donut hole being closed for all Part D drugs, um, which include cancer, but Cancer is actually a big spender, but it's not the only spender in that market. Um, and really the question is, will what will manufacturers do, knowing that they're already on the hook for, this, for funding, financing this, they already want give lots of patient assistance program, uh, program support that is apparently very generous, and they're facing very significant discounts and rebates for acquisition prices already, which are kind of in this unintended consequence of the existing system. You know, what are the, I mean, so I think that they have some political pressure to temper these prices, but also, if they can show value, and I mean either there's a personalized therapy for cancer or they save money from inpatient costs or other types of costs, I think these prices are going to continue. There's a question back. Yeah, yeah, quick question. I was here recently for a new Milani's presentation on medical innovation. And I'm a nurse by background um, with the recognition that you know value and um, willful neglect on patient side or provider side might make the distinction of why you have different outcomes. The provider doesn't give the drug that they should have or the patient doesn't continue the practice that they should have irrespective of the other complexities. So that from a background standpoint, the question that I wanted to ask is, have you been working with a new and his innovation value space? When, because when I look at this, to me they match um, in so many different ways. So I wanted. Um, thank you. So Anoop is a good colleague of mine, and we sit on opposite sides of the political debate around many things. And so I am a little bit aware of the of Anoop's work in this area, and actually many of his papers are actually seminal in it for my work. Um, but um, I would say that um, I am very focused on providing, pa on, on getting reforms that actually provide patients with true value here. And I'm, I'm less worried about insurers and manufacturers. They'll, they'll find their own way. Drug next source to kind of share the profits the drug companies are making and just pay for them for our own citizens? Um, you mean tax, tax exports in a way that we already do not? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, okay, so um, the vast majority of drugs and cancer that we consume, probably half of them are made in the U.S. and the rest of them are made off seas, uh, overseas. And if they're not made over, if they're not the final finish is made overseas, they're actually the ingredients are made overseas. So it's a little exports may not be 
the way here, or taxing exports may not be the way. But I think your question raises some, an important, another important point, which is that we pay high prices here. And in some sense, we subsidize the rest of the OECD countries, right? But the subsidy, um, the, the prices that we pay go for continued investment in innovation moving forward. Um, I think there remains a willingness to, in, to invest in that types of innovation and a willingness of the US population to pay some prices for these continued things. Whether what we do in terms of direct price controls or indirect price controls will really matter, both for what we get and what other countries get. Um, but you shouldn't jump to conclusions that um, just because we don't centrally price negotiate doesn't mean that we actually don't get pretty good deals on some of these drugs. In fact, again, Dick and I were just in um, Europe, and I learned that Tisigna, which is a recently, uh, recently approved branded TKI, um, which I think is, I think the monthly cost is somewhere around 8,800 um, per month. Um, in, in Germany, it's $9,800 a month. And in Italy, it's $7,800 a month. So actually, Germans are paying more um, than we are for that drug. Um, so um, yes, we subsidize. That is true. But um, there is some modification of price for these branded drugs. Um, across the board um, that isn't shared in other countries. Again, they ration on the supply side. Already. On this last point, Richard Epstein is often worried about parallel imports. You, you sell a drug in another country for a lower price than your own country, and the drug comes back to your market. Yeah. Is there any data on that? Um, right, so in Europe, European countries are really worried about parallel imports. And in fact, there's this whole sequence about who actually negotiates for these drugs because they want to make sure that they kind of get the best deal, but it's not so much the best deal. Manufacturers worry that it's not so much the best deal that there will be this parallel importing. Um, I don't, I, I mean, the only way that I've heard this come up is why can't we just import can't really expensive cancer drugs from Canada. Um, and my view is, yes, you can. <laughs> um, but drug companies will actually raise prices in Canada um, if they recognize that the US market is consuming. Um, and then, I don't know, it gets really complicated. So <laughs> I don't know. Well, thanks very much, Rena. Thank you.